one. Hello, my name is Adrian. I'm about to try and demonstrate the internal workings of a Swift Elegance 645 2017 model. Uh, so hopefully you'll bear with me. Uh, the areas I want to quickly come to is going to be uh, the, the panel above the door, which is the 12 volt distribution, and also the consuming unit, which is now located underneath the fixed bed area. Uh, but before we do that, let's just explain, we have put the services on, which is your gas, your water, your battery, and mains electrics have all already been attached to this vehicle, uh, and that's all done uh, externally. And then basically we've come inside the vehicle, and I'm gonna come straight to the consuming unit because the supplies come uh, I'm having to climb into the bed area so bear with me a moment not too badly done no. okay so the first switch that I want to point out to you is this black switch it is what we call uh, the system shutdown button and it removes all the 12 volts from off of the vehicle that is uh, for winter storage uh, situation you'd actually have it in an out position like that so if my finger doesn't glance over it it's off when I press it in we should hear a couple of bleeps there we go uh, which is above the door is the two beeps that it's been emitted and that is now 12 volts going through the distribution board going up to the panel above the door but while I'm here I just want to point out on the fuse board this is all 12 volt fuses and uh, there's a little green light which is illuminated right now. I hope you can see on there. Yep. If I actually operate the charger switch, which is on the main side of the consumer unit, this green one here, uh, it's off. But it, and that light's now gone out. The light diode's gone out on the fuse board. If I press that back in again, the, the green light's now emitted. So I know the charger from the mains electrics is actually working up through the system as well. Uh, that will charge your leisure battery up and the actual charger itself is on the outside of the consumer unit um, located down here it's got a little red warning light on it just to say that it is receiving power too so you can see all that working at the same time so no other lights illuminated down there uh, is telling me that those fuses are all in good condition if there's ever a red light that appears the LED light down below, like the green one is illuminated, that is telling me that that corresponding fuse has actually blown and the circuit won't work, that it's now serving. Uh, to understand what the circuit is and what it does serve, on the outside of the PSU unit, you're going to find uh, some information down here. So this is actually corresponding number-wise to the fuse position and also it tells you what the ampage is which is the next line and then it will tell you the color of the fuse but also then what the actual uh, item serves so that's quick in, uh, information about what that fuse board is about the one immediately on the right hand side is for the mains uh, my mains electrics supply coming into the caravan so i'm just going to come to the uh, the mcbs and the rcd initially this is the rcd this, this point here, as indicated by the wording below, and these are MCBs, an RCD is called a re residual circuit device, and technically you should test the circuit every time you couple up to mains electrics when on site. The way you test it is to press this yellow button in, when I do that, the blue button should trip out, and I've also lost the illumination of the lights up here. All that you need then do is turn it back on again, the system is working correctly. That is what it is meant to do. The RCD is meant to trip when you press the yellow button. If it doesn't do that, you have not got a main supply coming into the uh, caravan. And I suggest you just have a quick consultation with the site owner or manager uh, so that they can establish why the reason the supply is not on your caravan. The MCBs are the same as fuses, but where a fuse, you have to replace it. An MCB will just trip out. All that you do is turn that back on again. Uh, once you've taken off the offending appliance which has caused it to fuse. So that's very quickly uh, on the MCBs and RCD. The green light is for the charger, battery charger. Uh, when you are coupled up mains electrics, I would say just leave that on all the time. It will monitor the state of the battery and if the battery needs to be charged, it will put a supply into it. It's all automatic. And the amber orange light that you can see here is for the uh, water heater, the, the boiler, basically, in the central heating system. If that's not on, I'm not going to have supply going across to the boiler, so that needs to be live as well. And it's straightforward, you're just turning that on, making sure they're live, and then you're on to your next items. So just to continue, we're now coming uh, to the control panel, the command panel above the door, 
and uh, I'm going to work this in a, a very basic mode for you because I don't want to overcomplicate. Uh, but what I'm going to do is turn the panel live, which is that now, and you can see that the LCD's dis display board's working. So I've got 14 volts displayed on the on the panel. Uh, I'm using my laser battery. Uh, I have got mains electrics, and at the moment, it, the time's saying approximately uh, 11.46, which if I put my watch up is, is actually 11.46, so <laughs> not bad at all. It's nice to see everything works. Um, this uh, indication down on this side is telling me how much water I've got on my onboard water tank, because this particular caravan, you can either use an external supply from an aqua roll to supply the caravan directly, or you could use that aqua roll to fill up your onboard tank and then from the water from there to come directly into the van as such. So there's several ways that you can actually use a water system on this vehicle, but let's make simplify it. Uh, the next things I want to turn on are the light circuits, which is that switch and the one above it. So I'm hitting both switches. Uh, and now, as you can see, uh, very quickly scanning around the vehicle, I've turned all the switches on, which is quite nice. And we have full illumination. Uh, actually, I haven't turned everything on on as well uh, all around the caravan so I'm going to show you where all the different light circuits are now within the caravan as well as those they are just master switches uh, so just be aware that is just a master switch okay so coming down by the entrance door you can see you've got a double light circuit here the first one the inner one is for this down lighter to work above the cocktail cabinet so that's on and off the second one, which is the one on the outer edge, is actually to turn the awning light on from internally. Uh, it's not very easy for you to see that, but you're going to have to trust me. I will have a look for myself. <laughs> yes, the awning light's working. And I've also now just turned the awning light off because I've hit that rocker switch twice. There's a second position where you can turn the awning light on. And it's the very top point on the command panel with a little uh, moon by the side of it. Uh, if I hit that button there, uh, I'm going to go back outside again. <laughs> And the awning light is on again and I have a little blue line which indicates that I have actually turned the awning light on now and now the awning light's gone back out again so that's the second way you'll be happy to hear there's a third way that I can also operate the awning light uh, and this is coming on to the country uh, to the uh, key fob and what I'm looking at here the first button at the top is just for illumination of a, a light at the back end here. So that as you're approaching the entrance door at night time, you could probably just illuminate the lock. The second one is to arm and disarm the alarm. If I press it once, one beep indicates that the alarm is now active. Press it again. Two beeps tells me that the alarm is now deactivated. So one beep is arm, two beep is disarm, and it's the second button down for that operation. If I want to operate the awning light from the key fob, I can press that there. I'm going to go back outside because it's not in case on the panel. You love it. And it's on. So the awning light is on now externally, and I'm going to do it again just to turn it off again. So I can turn it on or I can turn it off. Yes, and that's now gone off by there. Right, so that's how you actually turn the awning light on when you're ready to use it. You can do it off this key fob or the other key fob. It works on both. Um, it will also uh, turn itself on, the awning like this is, when you actually arm or disarm the alarm, it's a visual indication that you have pressed it and it will actually stay on for a 30 second period. So the awning light does illuminate when you arm or disarm the alarm for 30 seconds. So just be aware of that as well. Can be useful if you are uh, been out for an evening meal somewhere, you're coming back and it's dark, you've disarmed the alarm, the awning light turns itself on just for illumination purposes. So it just helps you gain access into your caravan. So that bit there is now sort of covered on the con control panel. So the awning light top button, to turn the, the other lights on is these two buttons down here. To turn the water pump on is this switch here, which I am gonna come back to, but I just wanna finish off with the lights. So you've got four spotlights at the front end of the caravan. It's got its own individual switches on them, they're rocker switches. And I just want to demonstrate that there's an illumination that you can increase or decrease as you can see that light strengthening as we as we roll the, the back control so you have that operation there that's that one off so that's what we're turning to increase or decrease the uh, intensity of light so coming on to the next rocker switch there's that one going off and immediately behind uh, the only reason i'm showing you is that these lights are obviously operative so you can see that they are working and functioning 
And immediately above our head, uh, into the panoramic window area, we have got uh, a rocker switch on the panel, which is just for illumination of this particular light unit there. And now we're gonna come on to uh, corner pods, which are these two strip lights in the middle, and also uh, the illumination of LEDs of the corner panels here. The corner panel ones, I believe, is that switch there. It's located on the console unit at the front, and it's the outer switch there. So that's turning that one on and off. Yeah. And the second one uh, is doing the floor light. Sorry, there's a courtesy light down at floor level, just by the entrance door. Uh, hopefully you can see that working. Mm -hmm. And that is just if you are using, somebody using a, a bed area here at the front end of the caravan and need to do a quick run to the loo at night time, rather than turning every light on in the caravan, you can just operate that little rocker switch there and it just illuminates the floor area up. So, coming across to uh, that panel there, I'm trying to remember where the light switches are now for it. <laughs> uh, these two are for the kitchen area. One is for the behind the splashback, there's illumination coming off there. Um, it's the wrong one, there it is there. And the other one is the one above, it's the down lighters coming in above on the lockers. But I also still have illumination underneath the locker, which is uh, shining its light down onto the work surface. And that is just a small rocker switch on the LED strip light there. Okay, on that bit. Plenty of lights in this caravan. So I'm trying to remember desperately where that uh, switch was, and it is somewhere, but I can't remember. Uh, there it is. I remember now, they've hidden it from me. <laughs> okay, so it's a, a switch here on the front offside corner and it just turns those uh, tube, tube lights off. Brilliant. Okay, so there we are with those. Um, I am going to come, uh, rather than do all the lights at the moment, what I'm going to try and do is just stay forward, cover the most of the items in this forward area and then I'll move to the back and I'll show you the light circuits on the back end as we go further through. Okay, so just to uh, point out at the moment, that's the combi boiler. It's a central heating boiler. It heats both the, the room itself, but also the hot water that you require in the kitchen area or for a shower or something like that. It's all done in that silver black box there. Um, and I'm just gonna point out a couple of little bits and pieces, and it's located underneath this area here. Uh, this is very useful and very easy to use. I hope you find it useful to use. This symbol here, is to do with this white drain down tap here. Now it depends on which way you have that directed as to which what services it's going to feed. So if I want to fill up my internal tank, which is down there, my internal tank, I must have the switch in a downward position, i.e. like so. And then I can use an outside connection to fill that onboard water tank. I personally don't like using onboard water tanks. If I was using this system and this was my caravan, I would use an Acarol on the outside of the caravan. I would have it in an external supply, as you can see. So the arrow for that tap now needs to be pointing in the direction I've turned it to. The other two items it's referring to are the drain down valves. That's that yellow valve there. When it's horizontal, it's closed. You can hear I've raised it and water is now escaping from the vehicle underneath the floor of the caravan and that's a drain down purpose for winter it's got about winterization and storage so again what i'd refer you to is please uh, have a read of these instructions here and it just explains in greater detail what i'm very quickly going over okay so i've uh, chosen the uh, locations of how i want the supply to come into my caravan and so i'm using an outside source there are two uh, connectors on the outside of the caravan you're not going to see them until we go on the outside but there are two connectors the uh, top one if I remember right I might have this wrong now actually in fact I will leave it until we go outside but one of them serves it so that I can use my Acquarol to come directly straight to my kitchen tap and that's what I've located it onto I want to turn the pump on so I'm going to come to the tap symbol here and I've made sure all the drain down taps and all the all the uh, all the taps are closed in the kitchen area in vanity to make sure that I'm not going to lose water. I'm now going to turn it on. You can hear the pump running. It's just building up the pressure that we lost when we uh, opened up the drain down tap. There we go, it, the pump's now gone silent and I'm going to come to the kitchen tap itself. 
We have pre-bled this system, as I say, I have set it up already, so I'm coming to the cold position. Now, this is actually opposite to what the Swift manufacturer recommends. The Swift recommends that you actually bleed the system through on hot. And uh, I don't do that. I always do it on the cold side first, and I'm going to explain the reasons why. But let's just uh, turn the tap on. Running water through on cold. Once we've established the flow, a nice steady flow, then we can in turn it through to the hot side. And what I'm now doing, uh, or have pre-done already, is actually filled the hot water tank inside the combi boiler. The pump runs on for a few more seconds because what it's doing is actually building the pressure back up into the system. So you hear, always hear the pump run on slightly. And because we haven't got any uh, upholstery located in this seat area, that's the reason why it's quite noisy. So just be aware of it. When the cushions are back down, it is a lot quieter, but you will never stop uh, hearing the noise. It will give you some uh, noise background when, when the pump's running. Once we've established a good flow of water, that's when we actually come across to now the other controls, which I'm going to come to in a moment, which is going to be this control here, the Audi heating, because we can turn the boiler on. We should only turn the boiler on when that tank is full. I'm on about the hot water tank in the boiler. Turn it on. Uh, it's good to say it's already on, actually. So I'm going to turn it off. <laughs> OK, so that's the off position. I'm now going to turn it on. And it tells you it's an Audi boiler. It's the 3020, which is the very latest boiler on the market. And internally, it's telling me right now that the internal temperature inside this caravan is 22 degrees centigrade. That's as we are right now, whether the heating's on or not. That's also telling me that I have got a main supply. So I know that I've turned on the orange switch, which is on that PSU unit. So that's telling me I have got main supply across to here. So that's the standby menu. I'm now going to go to the next menu, which is the programming, one of the programming menus. And at the moment, it's saying that the internal temperature, I've asked it to reach 18 degrees centigrade. If I want to increase it, I press the plus symbol until I get it to where I want it to be. And I'm going to say 24 degrees. It's flipping warm, by the way, 24 degrees. Uh, I was filming one of these earlier today and I was uh, beginning to struggle. So that's 24 degrees I've asked it to work at. And I'm going to come directly now down to the next symbol, which is uh, a triangle um, and it's half black and half clear i can that is it's a three-way switch i want you to imagine it's a three-way switch it's set in the middle position so it's set that it's doing half black half clear um what that means is it's doing both sides of the boiler i.e central heating and hot water supply if i ask it to go completely black i'm just doing one side of the operation if i press the minus button and ask it to complete completely clear again i'm only doing one side of the operation and in this case when it's completely clear i know i'm only doing the central heating so a clear triangle central heating only half and half i'm doing both central heating and hot water completely blacked out i'm just doing hot water now if i go back to the standby menu I've lost a symbol up on the top left hand corner here. It's a round circle with a couple of little direction arrows on it. If I put the central heating back on again and go back again, we're going to see that symbol come there. That symbol is the circulation of the central heating fluid uh, and that's being pumped, flowed around the perimeter of the, of the vehicle through the radiators. So that's when I know that central heating is working. If I turn my temperature down, you can see it's now at 23. If I just lower that thermostat down, just so you can see it, that it does work, uh, what I'm referring to, I've lost the circulation because I've reached the room thermostat. So if you want to increase the thermostat uh, temperature within the caravan, increase that thermostat to where you feel comfortable. If it's too warm, obviously lower it back down. Uh, in the summer, hopefully we don't need the thermostat on at all. So I would load that right down to number five. I think it's five degrees is its lowest setting. I would load that right down to five degrees. I wouldn't bother changing that setting because if the thermostat can't allow the central heating to cut in because it's greater than five degrees, then it, all it's going to serve is the hot water. So that's the way I actually use my system. Right, the next symbol is to do with mains electrics. It's got a little zigzag by the side of it and it's got one kilowatt on there at the moment, which I'm only drawing a very slight main supply, but I could increase that to two kilowatts or I could increase it to three, but I'm not going to keep it on three because unfortunately we haven't got a fantastic supply uh, on site and I can operate it safely at one, but I can't operate it on the higher number. So I'm just leaving it on one kilowatt as a background heat. 
and I've also asked for gas to work with it in conjunction with the mains. Don't have to, the symbol's now blue and, uh, and that's the gas supply turned off. But if I want the gas to support it, it's turned on like so. Now I do also use my system with mains and gas at the same time. I normally always go to a site where I've got mains electrics available. Uh, and the reason why I use it both, people say I'm being uh, extravagant and uh, why do I need to do so? Once it's heated the boiler up on its initial heat up, the gas side of that boiler shuts down. It doesn't necessarily show you that it's gone blue. It's not gonna do that. Uh, but it only comes in in a supporting role should my demand be greater than what the mains can sustain on the system. So at one kilowatt is quite limited uh, and the gas side of it is supporting it at the moment to actually uh, bring sufficient heat into the vehicle. So I'm a little bit different. I do always use gas and mains at the same time. You don't have to. You have a choice of whether you do use mains or whether you do use gas. It depends on what's available, of course. The only other area I'm going to show you on this system, because that's up and running, is just going to come into this uh, spanner symbol. I'm going to press that. I'm going to bring you to this display. There are many other menus within this system, and I don't want you to get into them if I can help it. Just simplify things for yourself at the moment. Let's go back into this symbol here, uh, and I'm looking for what I can't find. That's what I'm looking for. That symbol there, that replicates this panel. And I'm gonna access it by going into it. And at the moment, it says at the top there, bright. What I'm going to do is change that to invert. And I'm gonna confirm it by coming out the menu again. That's still the same, nothing's changed there at all. But where it does change is the standby menu. What it's done is gone black with white uh, lettering. It's still very visible. You can read it during daylight hours. But what it's not doing is illuminating a quite a large bright light at night time when you're trying to sleep. Some people probably like a, a background light on. I personally don't. It's got to be pitch black, uh, only because I'm a bit of a vampire. Uh, no. uh, so I prefer it to be a dark screen, uh, but that's just a personal preference. You don't have to. I'm just showing you how easy it is to change that symbol. Go. Okay, so we have uh, established and set up the system on the boiler. Um, that will take approximately about 20 minutes for it to heat up sufficiently. So you can see water, hot water coming through our tap. So while I'm demonstrating other items, that's just going to be in the background working as it would for yourself when you're on site. So uh, I can't do any more on that at this moment. So I'm going to come to the next item, which is going to be the refrigerator. This particular unit has got a separate freezer box altogether. So my fridge is down below and I've got a separate freezer box above. So quite nice in having separates. Right, this is the travel catch. And to get the travel catch to work, obviously I have to press it down. What that does is operate that little claw there, as you can see. Uh, and I can use that in normal use, but obviously I've got to press it down every time to be able to get to, to open the fridge. On this particular refrigerator door, and the same applies on the freezer box, there's a little button underneath which I can push up, a little tag. If I push that up, it moves the claw out the way. What I'm relying on now, when I'm on site, is a magnet. So I'm not relying on having to operate the catch, I can just do that as a pull and push. So if I put the latch back down to engage it again, all that you're doing is pushing against the claw to push it back down, it moves the tag down, and now I'm back on that claw system. Yeah. Same applies on the top. It's exactly the same process. I don't need to repeat it, but there it is, the claw out the way. Therefore, that isn't doing anything. Uh, if I put the claw back in again, you can see it's now operating again. Yeah, so very basics on that. The other bit I'm gonna show is uh, for winter storage while it's, uh, I'm talking about the door. And for winter storage, what I'm going to do is just push this little tag in again, push it in slightly and push it, pull it forward at the same time. What that's done is allowed this two catches to travel further forward. And as now the claw comes in contact with that, it creates an air gap. So during the winter conditions, when the vehicle's not being used for any, anything uh, for a long period of time, it just uh, allows the air to flow through, stops mildew from building up in the refrigerator uh, or, or the fridge or freezer rather. Uh, so that's just over a winter period. When you don't want that ventilation to take place, you just need to push that tag back in again 
and push it back. So if you can just watch me very quickly. Oh, sorry. Push the tag in, push the two, push those two back, and that now slides out of the way. And that's now standard use again. Okay, so let's open up again. You can see a bit more working here for you. So at the moment, we have set this uh, working on mains electrics and I've got the thermostat working at it at a full rate. Um, we have only just set it up, so it's not really got cold as yet. But uh, this is the on-off button. There's off. There's on. It will automatically go back to the last item it was working from. It automatically selects what it was working from last time. And I've asked it to work at full rate. The higher up the scale you go, the colder the fridge and freezer is going to get. Uh, as I say, I'm, I'm making it work off mains electrics. And I don't know if you noticed, but the panel lights then, just these, these panel lights slightly dulled down. If I press one of these again, you're going to see them come brighter again. Can you see that illuminated brighter? Uh, so when, I, when it is bright, I can change one of the functions or the temperature. That's going to go into an alarm. Uh, and I'm going to explain what that is. So when on site, you either got mains available to you or gas. That's the choices when on site. While in transit, you use this particular one, the battery, which the power source is coming from your tow vehicle on a caravan situation. Um, and there are a couple of things that do need to happen. First off, the engine has to be turned on, the ignition working, the engine turning over. Obviously, you need to have the 13-pin plug at the front coupled into the back of the car. And you do need the panel above the door to be live. If the panel above the door isn't live, this panel does not work. I'm on about the command panel. You do have to have it turned on. So if that switch above the door, i.e. the on-off button, is off, you won't get that to work because it hasn't got a supply to make it work. Right, while we've been doing that, I have asked it to work off gas. I did hear the ignition system take place and I know that it's functioning. We may get an alarm button come up here in a moment, a bit of a noise in the background, because if I leave my refrigerator door open for more than two minutes, it may be I'm loading it with beer or whatever it may be. I'm trying to find where I put the last beef burger. Uh, it will go into an alarm. It does uh, activate an alarm after two minutes, just as an uh, audible noise to tell you that's what you've actually done. So you're aware that that's happened. So I'm gonna wait for that to do if I can. <laughs> but while I'm doing that, I'll just explain then about how you change the thermostats. There we go. Yeah. As, all, as If almost on time, <laughs> there's the alarm button for me. Uh, now, if I close the door up, the alarm has now stopped. I could open that back up again straight away and I've got another two minutes before it actually activates again. So just to make sure you are aware that's what it will do. This is your thermostat. Uh, as I, you can see, I press, keep pressing it in and it goes up a sliding scale. The higher up the scale it goes, the colder the refrigerator and freezer gets. Obviously, so for winter use, you are probably on the lower ones from midway to lower. Uh, but obviously, hopefully, high to the summer, south of France, something like that, you are going to need it on the highest setting to make them work. I'm just going to point out this little button here. This is a button this time. Uh, it is a failure button. And what you'd need to do sometimes is to press that button in to clear the fault. So you press and hold that till you hear a beep and it clears the fault. If you don't, if this fails and you don't clear the fault, the fault will remain on the fridge until you do so. So do be aware that you have to clear faults by pressing and holding that button there. Okay, so that's on gas and it's functioning fine. That's on mains electrics and I'm gonna let it dull down by itself. Uh, so I'm gonna close those up just to so that we can see where the fridge works. And again, we're gonna find, it's gonna be about half an hour before that starts to happen. I'm not gonna be talking for half an hour. Right, <laughs> cooking facility. Uh, we've got an electric ring and then we've got three supporting gas rings. We've got two which are what I call the, the larger size and one small one. And all these are operated off these valves here. Obviously, we've got another two valves, which is one's going to be for the grill, one's going to be for the oven. So we'll go through them. But just before I go to start igniting everything, there's a little warning symbol on the back here, which has got a gas match uh, with a stroke through it. Uh, it says on the panel, do not shut the glass lid when any of the burners have been alight. That's what it says down here. And it also says it repeats it in French, I think. Um, why? I don't know. Uh, but uh, 
If these have been working for a long period of time, you do need to allow heat to disperse from the air before you put this lid back down. That's self-explanatory to a point. Um, it is toughened glass and if it is heated, it will shatter when you lower that down. So just be aware that you've got to allow heat to disperse from that area. Coming to the left hand valve then, we've got numbers one to six and I can go direct to six or I could go direct to one or any other number in between. And it's to operate this electric ring here. I am gonna put my fingers on it. I've turned it on to number six. Actually, it's my palm, and I know it's now coming through. All right, so I'm not going to have any more than that. You're just going to have to trust me. That's what it does. <laughs> so coming on to the uh, rings, I turn it from the off position to the full flame, which is where I'm at now. Press the valve in, press the piezo, and the gas ring is now on. Hold it in for depress for 10 seconds, release, turn it to the low setting should you require low settings. So you've got a variable heat source between those. So the next ones, I'm going to come to these two items over here, which are going to do these two valves here. So again, full flame, strike the piece of igniter, small rings on, on the full flame, there's high, there's low, and there's off. Same one on the rear, full flame, low, high, off. So that brings us to the central two, and the central two, one's going to be for the grill and one's going to be for the oven. Uh, the one with a little dash there above it on the top part of the square is indicating this is for the grill. And then the dash below on this one is indicating it's going to be for the oven located below. As I open that up, just take note that there is a heat shield which pulls forward when the grill's in use. Uh, it just deflects any heat away from these valves so it stops them from getting hot. Uh, stops them from being overheated. The grill, turn it to the full flame, press the, the valve in. Strike the piece of igniter, uh, away she goes. I'm just going to take that pan out of the way, the grill pan out of the way for a moment. Just going to put that on the floor, just so you can see the flame. Uh, do be aware, there's a little couple of flames that keep on like popping here. Don't worry about that, it's not a gas leak, it's meant to happen. Uh, it is uh, characteristic that if you only ignite one side of the grill, it automatically shoots around and ignites the other side by itself. And that's why that just pops now and again. So be aware of it, that's what it's meant to do. That's on high, there's low, and obviously you've got the off position there. Now somewhere in here, if I remember right, there it is, I hope it couples on. There we go. So the grill pan handle comes in at a 45 degree angle approximately onto that position there, and then you can put the grill pan where you need to for use. Uh, what it's doing by doing it that way, you're putting a slice of bread there and a slice of bread there, go in there. If you are cooking bacon and things like that, you may be to have it in that location, but it's purely down to yourself. There's no given rules. I'll let you work that one out for yourself. When I close the grill door up, that uh, heat shield goes back, retracts. Lower the oven door down. When we're coming to use the oven, turn the valve all the way around to its maximum setting, which in this case is 240 degrees. I'm going to press the valve in. Press the piece of igniter, you'll see the flame at the back ignite. Hold it in for about another 10 seconds, depress the valve for 10 seconds, and then release. And that is the flame up and running. The oven door has to be closed for heat to build up in there for the oven to actually regulate itself accordingly. Wherever you leave the valve here is equivalent to domestic oven. So approximately uh, around that position there, between the 200 and 220 is approximately regular six on the old gas regulators on domestic and that will be equivalent heat that it would get up to because it's such a very small oven they're very efficient they really do cook uh, well chips whatever it is meat very well so the off position is that there so just below the oven we have got the pan storage area uh, just to release the catch and the only reason i'm bringing you to the pan storage area there is a mains plug and socket just down here uh, the plug is obviously located into that socket and it is to serve the electric ring on the top of the cooker. If that plug isn't in, then that electric ring will not work. So just be aware there is a plug and socket located below in the pan storage area that needs to be uh, positioned in the, uh, in the socket for that supply to work. The reason it's plug and socket is because we can actually remove that oven without having to have a qualified electrician to actually reinstall it. It's just a simple plug and socket, so uh, we're not having to go through uh, 17th edition or 18th edition uh, electrics these days. Okay, so 
Microwave is a straightforward microwave. It's a plug and play system. I'm not gonna to go too much onto that apart from here's a start button. I press that, the microwave's working. If I actually do that, I've stopped it at 58 seconds. If I press it again, I've cleared the timer. So press that several times and the timer will increase minute wise. Uh, this is a very quick way of me actually doing it. So if I wanted to heat something for two minutes, press it twice, once, twice. I've got two minutes on the clock, away she goes. I'm gonna clear that because I haven't got in there anything in there for heating purposes. You can also scroll this button here, uh, which has got timer, power and weight on it. So there are a lot more functions on it, but I would recommend that you do read the manual for that particular operation of this particular appliance. Um, it just goes into it in a great more depth and uh, a microwave is very simple to use, but if you want me to set top clocks and timers and things like that, it, uh, it's probably better if you refer to the uh, owner's handbook. Right, this is uh, the glass lid, uh, sorry, not glass lid, uh, the, the turntable is glass. Uh, I don't travel with my glass inside my microwave. It's recommended, in my opinion, that you actually put that somewhere safe for transit. Uh, there's no given position, but a lot of clients I know do actually put the glass, glass uh, plate underneath something like that in between the mattresses so in transit it's not going to come out of there it's actually quite a tight fit in there so just a life hack <laughs> just something there for you to use as reference okay so i'm going to load that lid down be aware of that one as we're coming further now into the back end of the vehicle uh we have got some of the light switches around it says he looking for them and it's on the side of the Welsh dresser unit here. It's a double switch, so it's split in the middle. So we are going to have one do the downlighters. And I'm referring to downlighter in the wardrobes and also the overhead lockers. Okay, so that's the inner one of the two. The bottom one, remember me saying about a courtesy light down at floor level? I've got the same happening down here on the end of the panel here. So the outer switch is just for illumination of a floor area at night time, should anybody in this area need to go to use the bathroom. So I'm going to put the bed down just so that we can actually get to the spotlights and things like that. Uh, and forgive me for these backrest and base cushion being on the, on the bed, but it just helps me expose what I needed to. This is exactly the same as the other uh, spotlights. You've got your rocker switch on them to operate them, and you've also got your illumination. Excellent. My colleague's doing so well. <laughs> uh, right, I'm now going to come through into the bathroom, toilet compartment, and uh, I'm just looking for them. There they are, they're immediately behind me. Again, I've got a double light switch here. Um, so one is doing, as you can see, the shower cubicle only. Okay, so that's the inner one of the two is doing the shower cubicle only. The other one is doing the down lighters, as you see within the vehicle. And the, mirror, and the mirror lights. Okay, so the outer one's doing the mirror lights, down lighters. The one on the inner one is doing shower cubicle only. Mm -hmm. uh, as we are going around the van, obviously this is a towel radiator. It's working off the central heating system. And just on the top edge here is a bleed valve. So from periodically, from time to time, we do need to uh, bleed air out of the system. This is the highest point in the system, apart from the reservoir. Uh, you can't bleed from off the reservoir. The reservoir is just a holding tank which contains the fluid which is being pumped around the radiators. So if you do need to release air out of the system, just come to this, there's a special tool to do it with which is supplied in the caravan, and you just tighten it slightly until you see the antifreeze fluid coming out of uh, out the top end here. Bleed the air out of the system. We've already pre-done this, of course. Okay, so while I'm in the bathroom, very quickly, uh, I'm not going to give you a full demonstration of everything, so I don't do the loo search and I don't do the shower. Uh, but there are a couple of things on here I need you to be aware of. That's called an Eco Camel uh, shower head. It's a very uh, economy way of using water. Uh, obviously, you can see there's a ring of water which uh, does give you a really good shower head. I've got one of these in my particular caravan. On it, you, have, you do have an on off switch. The on off switch is there so that you don't have to change the temperature setting on, on the mixer tap. Because this water is really hot when it comes out of the shower, I suggest that you, when you want it on hot, you have the shower head facing away from you. 
if you've got it pointing at you yes the initially it's going to be really cold water that comes through then the hot comes through it's really hot water it will uh, if you're not careful it certainly shock you if not burn you so be aware that it is hot water turn it as a mixer once you've got the water facing away turn in the mixer get the temperature right if you wanted to then you could turn the tap off you could put it into your rise and fall rail raise it up above your head if that's where it's got to go and then just turn the uh, tap back on again we've not changed the temperature setting obviously water's and I'm meeting up coming out onto my head or it should be um right just be aware also on the camel head there's a series of holes around the handle area which just allows water to disperse out of the shower head itself when you turn the tap off you'll see a small amount of water dribble out of these holes that is standard it's to release the pressure out the shower head so that it doesn't freeze in a winter condition so that's a characteristic you just need to be aware of when you turn it off you are going to get a dribble of water excess water just coming down there the shower door on this particular one has got a travel catch above so i've got to remove that pull that out to be able to operate the shower cubicle door <laughs> uh, and then that goes back again and if i'd only bought a bath towel i could have added the shower <laughs> but there you go work's not provided me with one yet <laughs> so that is just a hanging rail for waterproofs or a towel if if you want to dry something in this area uh, most people use waterproofs like peter storms just to hang and drip dry in there and that's just uh, that area that drops down this one coming to uh coming to the vanity basin i will run water through just so you can see it's working so cold side first raise it get water through on the cold side turn it through to the hot side and you never know i might get a bit of warm water coming through so i'm going to put my fingers underneath let it run for a bit longer. Ah, got some warm water coming through. In fact, it's getting in quite warm. So this is now roughly about 15 minutes being on. And I uh, don't know if you can see it, but steam's rising up. Hopefully you might be able to yep. pick it up. Uh, so you can see that it actually does operate. Okay, so several th things in the also in the toilet compartment area we've got a standard roof vent this is what i call an mpk roof vent uh, basically we've got lock locking handles i can't just push this roof vent straight up the locking handle is a transit and i have to push that in and then i can put it push it up pull that one in and i can push it up it locks on these lugs so you can't actually just push it straight up that's fully ventilated i can have it tilted one side the other way or of course that way or vice versa the other way of course and that is a standard roof vent mpk roof vent the fly screen just pushes back up again uh, there is a night blind why you'd want a night blind on a toilet compartment i don't know but it goes just on that so it's a little roller blind and it just locates like so and you push it back up again um, just in case you've been kicked out the bed or, or you're a vampire and you don't <laughs> like the moonlight or something so uh, coming back to your toilet, and I will do the, the windows and blinds. I'll probably operate it on the clear one outside. So let's come to the base uh, toilet itself. The bowl will rotate to wherever you feel more comfortable for it to be. Uh, in this particular caravan, I can't see any reason why you won't want it anywhere <laughs> other than that position there. It's got two tanks. The top tank contains flushing water. You fill that from externally on the outside through a small little uh, cap that lowers down use a hose pipe a watering can whatever is available to fill this tank up with flush water you can put a pink chemical into this uh, and the idea of the pink chemical it helps to keep the flushing water smelling nice uh, gives it a nice odor but it will also help to keep the bowl clean uh, so that's a pink chemical that you can add into that uh, if you want to, if you wish to do so you don't have to you can do the holding tank at the bottom, the cassette, is from here downwards. Okay, so that's where the cassette holding tank is. And then again, that's exposed externally. You can't access it internally. It's, it's all outside use. Imagine the toilet's been used. Obviously, I haven't, but imagine it's been used. I'm going to flush the toilet, which is pressing that blue button in there. Water. Here we go. We've got some pink fluid. Uh, so it does smell nice. <laughs> uh, flush the water around the bowl 
get sufficient water in there that you want and then I'm going to come to a lever on the front edge right in the middle of the of the housing here I'm going to come to that lever I'm going to move it directly backwards and as I do that that water is now going to disappear do you want to watch it yep there it goes it disappears drops into its holding tank the lever's fully back and then I'm going to bring that lever forward again ready for the next use it's just sealed there's the lever open there's the lever closed uh, do close it again obviously you don't want any smells coming back into the caravan so the only other thing you need to know really about the toilet internally is if you do get an illumination of this area here uh, a little red light appearing in that symbol it's telling you that the holding tank below the waste tank below here is full uh, or very close to being full and needs to be emptied and that's all that you need to worry about on the toilet one so to continue, just so that you can see the sliding partition door, uh, this is the transit position. This has got a shooting bolt which goes up into the, uh, the overhead panel and then it will allow it to slide and come across for, for normal use when on site. But for transit, you slide that all the way back and the shooting bolt goes into the top and stops that from then traveling across. So that's the shooting bolt on that particular part there. Uh, I'm gonna to come to there's two roof vents and an omni vent in this particular caravan in the main living area. The standard vent just travels in a track. And if I can do it, it that locks in there. That's roughly six inches open. Uh, norm, quite nice ventilation, but you could have it fully open if you wish to, or you could have it in a nighttime ventilation point, which if I can operate the handles goes into that location there. So about an inch open about six inches open fully opens in the tracks there we do also have a night blind and a fly screen uh, you can choose to where you want those to be obviously during the day you probably have the fly screen across you don't want the flies in uh, at night time you don't want to have the moonlight in if you're not feeling romantic okay and all the way to the closed position which is that, and that little push button catch shoots out to lock the handle in place. So to release it is that, that's locked. Brilliant. And that's the standard roof vent. Uh, there are two positions for a television, uh, which I've just gone past the Welsh dresser. Uh, well, I saw, call it Welsh dresser, your, your vanity area here, uh, dressing table, where we have got mains points, 12 volt and aerial points, all located on this wall by the mirror. Uh, but I'm going to ignore those because that's all going to be replicated at the front on the console and I'll show you where that is. But let's just come to the standard Omni vent. Uh, the Omni vent, if you are going to use the uh, fan, you do need the vent to be in an open position. You shouldn't operate it uh, with the uh, lens completely closed down. So it doesn't have to be fully open, but open. Uh, the on-off switch is this. And I'm going to turn it and you can see all the light illuminations. And it always always extracts first so the direction and that little illuminated light there tells you that it's going out now at the moment that's only at half a speed half a revolution in my opinion if i hit that button again i'm going to get a brighter light appear just one single light but it's actually picked up a speed a little bit so i'm going to call that one one and a half two two and a half three three is its maximum fan speed if you want to slow that fan speed down, I can either use the other symbol, which is drawing fresh air in from outside, and lower it to the uh, fan speed that I want it to be. As you can see, that's one. Hopefully you've seen the different lights as they were coming on. So, that is now, uh, it's going to stop the fan from working, but I've still got it live. I'm going to change direction now. And as you can see, I've only got a very small light in the background. There's the full illumination, that's one. One and a half, two, two and a half, and three. Stop it. That was drawing fresh air in from outside. So you can use that in the summer. It does cool the caravan down. It's quite nice. Uh, it's no good though if you have a two pail, <laughs> so I'm told. Uh, but if I press that switch again, it will go to extraction. As I say, it always extracts when you first turn it on. And that's all you need to know about that. Apart from it has got another night blind for the same purposes it had before, uh, but it does lock out in different locations. So just grab the two little catches as you move it across. Standard Omni vent. 
We've already demonstrated this roof vent, which is the same exactly as the one at the rear above the fixed bed area. So again, you've got blinds and fly screens and you've got a handle which travels in a track uh, and guides you through into the different locations. That's it fully raised, of course. This is just a panoramic window. Panoramic window is fixed. Uh, you can't do anything apart from lower that blind like so. Uh, this Constantine the blind can be a bit of a bone of contention because these pleats over a period of time, I'm on about storage type situations, uh, these pleats tend to extend like so. So down here it's quite tight, but these pleats tend to fall out slightly. It's a gravity thing. So when you carefully come to put it back, just feed the pleats back in. It's all right on this one right now because it, the pleats are still whole. But if they had fallen out, just be aware of it. It is a characteristic of what happens. The pleats look slightly fall out. Just use your other hand to guide it into the track and they'll come back. If that's compressed for more than uh, 24 hours, you'll find that you'll have nice tight pleats like that. Doesn't really matter on the windows. Uh, the windows, they'll naturally fall in place. But you can probably see that that's slightly slacker of a pleat than what it is here. So uh, they will just Constantine rock, but that is how they're meant to be. So that is your night blind, and that is your fly screen. Your fly screen you can draw all the way down to the bottom. Uh, that's as simple operation as that. Same applies to the ones on the front, there's no difference. Uh, but what I am going to point out is something that can happen. Uh, I will demonstrate on this window. What I want you to be aware of, if you push against the, this part of the frame here, you can get that blind to go into that location there. So if you look on this, it's nice and tight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but this bracket now is sitting back. As I try and pull that down now, what's happening is I'm dragging against the window rubber. So it's really tight for me to actually lower it down. If I just put it back into the track, it guides up very easily. So if you find a blind that is very difficult to operate, just have a look to see if the guides are really on the front edge of the blind track itself. If, if you see there's a gap, you've actually pushed it further back and you just need to put it back into the right location. So just something to help you on site. Uh, window operation, uh, leave the latches. Uh, when they're fully in, as you can see, they are right now. That is completely sealed. So to get some small amount of ventilation, you can have it in the latch position, uh, half latch position. You can get your fingers through there. So if people were to pull those, they could actually uh, gain access to the caravan. So do be aware that it's not completely secure, but it's a lot better than um, if you just have it in this position, which is now opening and I'm just tightening up the thumb screws just to hold the arms out. So you can have that in any location, but if it was like that, obviously all you're gonna do is just pull it over further open. And you can position those where you want to. When you want to close the window, just slacken the thumb screws slightly and then you can see they'll come back down again and lock it to where you want to. Right, so while I'm on this caravan, I'm just gonna point something out. Uh, over in this uh, top left, uh, sorry, bottom left hand symbol, if you can, I don't know if you can see it. Yes, you can just about, just about, there it is. It's got a book symbol in a round circle. What that means is read your owner's handbook. Uh, what I'm gonna make you aware of, that if that blind was completely down in very strong sunlight, the sunlight will generate heat behind the blind and it will be reflected back against the window. Uh, that reflection can cause that perspex to distort. And if it does do that, it's not covered under a warranty situation. For storage, I'm recommending that you keep a small amount of ventilation at the top of the window. Uh, so if you are at a storage park, obviously we do get some, you know, some, some sunny days during the winter. Uh, it can be quite strong and intense. Uh, so just be aware, it does need to be like that. If you actually leave it in that position, which is sensible to a point, but if that sun's then reflecting against that Perspex panel, it can distort it and that is not claimable under warranty. That is exactly the same for this front Perspex window at the front, the panoramic window. Do leave a small gap. It may be you say it's going to fade upholstery. This is leather upholstery, so uh, it's not going to apply on this one. But that's the way I need it to be. If you don't do it like that, unfortunately, we could be ended up in trouble. Right, so I'm going to put this board back. Uh, this is just, uh, if I can get it in the right location trying to remember which way it is, it's that way around there. The larger cutout here goes against that part of the bed frame there. Okay, so that's the board going over the top of the boiler. If you're wanting to make a double bed in this area, we uh, pull the slat board forward. 
travels in the track, it's quite nice. And then it comes to these stops. Just lift that front board up and then back into that location there. That doesn't now travel back. It's nice and tight on the rest of the remaining slats. And that is your base. What you would then do is reverse all these cushions because you get all the undulations uh, on your upholstery. It's better if you actually sleep on the reverse side of the mattress. That is what's recommended. Uh, as you can see, it's got square edges as opposed to a scrolled edge. And it's also tapered so that you're not going to get a full cushion take up if you're not careful. So sleep on the reverse side. That cushion wants to go to the outside edge. So the knee roll is on the outside edge. And that and that are the same height of mattress. Hopefully that makes sense. Obviously you do the same for the other two cushions in reverse. And that's how you'd make a double bed up on, uh, on this particular caravan. I'm going to just slide that back now. So I've just lifted the front board past those two little logs, one either side, and just push it all the way back. Drawers, all straightforward, they're soft close, so they automatically go back slowly. And we've got a little additional uh, pull-out table. I call it the occasional table. Do beware, if you press down on the back edge, you might lift that like so. So if it was a glass of wine here and you put your elbow there, <laughs> to support your head for some reason, your glass of wine's knocked over. So uh, just be careful. What you have got normally, uh, sorry, not on this model. I was gonna say normally, no, you haven't got it on this model. Um, on the very uh, newer vehicles, there's a little uh, tag that shoots up and, and pushes it up and supports it. So it's got a bit of a taper coming down that way and you can't then push that, that arm down. Unfortunately, this is the previous model range, but you can raise it and you can put other items below here. Uh, you know, people can't see necessarily what you got below there. So that is that one. Occasional table. So your TV can be mounted here. It, the reason why I'm saying that is not a good position. <laughs> uh, right, we've got mains points here. We've got a 12 volt point here and we've got USB. So I'm going to say these are more S for, 12, uh, for charging purposes. We have got a little uh, three and a half mil jack, which is located on this front pod, and that connects to the radio. So if you've got an iPhone that you wish to uh, play music through, back into the stereo, which is located on the top offside locker at the front, the larger one is where the stereo is, and I'm gonna put it in, and it's gonna start playing music. So I'm gonna turn it off again very quickly. Says he, there he goes, gonna start. This is automatic, it's starting to play itself. I'm not ready for it, so I'm gonna turn it off. Okay, so music can be played through your phone, through the uh, three and a half mil jack straight to there. You could also replicate that there. Okay. Go directly into it there. You've also got available USB. So if you've got on a memory stick music or something like that, you can play music that way. Obviously, you've already heard the music playing. <laughs> so press source. I'm going to turn the volume down a bit. I don't know what station the lads have tuned it in. Sounds like a bit Radio 1 ish. Uh, hey, there's Radio 1. Uh, so press it and it, it can do an automatic search if I get this right. I'm not going to do it, so I'm going to put it into Radio 2 mode for you for a moment. I'm going to scroll it down to 88.3. See who's playing on 88.3. Get there. Radio 2. And it's going to come up with Radio 2 on the display. Hopefully, there's Radio 2. If I want to retain that, press and hold number 2 until you hear, see a beep and memory. And that's now located Radio 2 into the memory of the, of the, of the radio. If you wish to change source, so I want to now change what I'm doing. This is on AM. Uh, that is there. There's AUX. That's either that connection or your USB. And then back to FM again. That's how you change stations. You when you're ready, press and hold the source button. And then that will actually go off like so. And that's all you need to know about the stereo. Uh, however, we do need to talk about the radio aerial. Uh, and I'm just looking to find out where the location is. It's probably above the fridge on this particular one. Ah, here we go. Okay, so in the locker above the refrigerator, 
uh, we have got the aerial pole itself. Uh, so what we've got is a typical, well, sorry, a, a nut that you release, a lock nut. You raise the aerial up and you just tighten that slightly just to uh, pinch it. Uh, and then basically you can rotate the aerial to where you need it to be to find the best reception area. While you're doing that, you obviously need to be looking at the TV to find out where the best signal's coming into. But once you've found it, then just lock the lock nut off. Um, this little handle here, I call it a crank handle. If you want to change uh, the, the actual aerial itself, it's in a horizontal plane at the moment, and you can change that plane from horizontal to vertical. The way you do it is just rotate that until you can't turn it anymore. I'm going to just have a look at something in a minute. I can't turn that anymore. I'm just going to drop that down. Right. If you see the V, that's telling me that that aerial now is vertical. If I rotate it the other way, you'll see that change into a green location where it's horizontal. And the green means that that is the position it should be in when tra traveling. So when you're traveling from A to B, you need it to be horizontal, not vertical. You can't bring the vertical aerial down sufficiently. Uh, where it's horizontal, you position that like so, so it's facing forward. Bring that right down, lock that back up again. And that's how you'd actually put it for traveling. The booster box, the amplifier box is this one here. It's got a little blue illumination light on it. I've turned it off because there's a switch just on the top edge. So that's on or off. Uh, again, it needs to be turned off in winter because that will drain your battery. And that little dial there, this little dial here, I'm just going to leave it. It is on the maximum high boost. If you rotate it anti-clockwise, you're lowering the amplification of the signal coming in. At the moment, I've put it on its maximum boost. And that's what you've got there. So I'm going to come into the wardrobe, the large wardrobe, and I think we're not too far off being complete. Yep, so the reason I brought you into the large wardrobe is to show you the uh, reservoir tank of the Audi fluid that's pumped around the, the perimeter of the vehicle through the radiators. I'm just removing the little cap. You can see that's a full rib. I only want these little small ribs to go back in when it goes back on. So that goes into this position here when I demonstrate it properly. So see, like so. If it's the full rib, you'll never get it to go past there. You only want the small ribs. So that's the first thing. That's the breather pipe. The breather pipe allows for expansion here to take place. Uh, basically, this water does expand. This fluid does expand when it's heated up. At the moment, we haven't got the boiler now working, but uh, if it was, you would see that slightly moving, dancing slightly. That's a characteristic. It's meant to do that. Uh, you can, when it is dancing, that means this fluid's been circulated around the radiators. Uh, and that's what the fluid is that's been heated up. It has got an antifreeze in there and it's a two year solution. We always test the quality of the solution because some customers might not use this very much at all, a caravan I'm referring to, but others may be using it all year round, in which case you can more or less say their fluid's gonna be useless uh, and needs to be replaced after two years. Uh, what we put back is a five year solution. It's a pink solution. Uh, we always put the five year back because it costs 175 pounds approximately to have this fluid removed from out of the system. It's a job really for a technician. It's not something we're recommending for the end user to be able to do, but it is a job that periodically does need to be uh, changed. Uh, so be aware of it. At the moment, this solution's fine. Otherwise we'd have removed it already. But if you do need to top the reservoir tank up, there's another nut on the top, which is flipping tight. Okay, so I've just removed that little jerry can type cap and that allows me access into the reservoir. And all that you need to do is fill the fluid up to about where it is right now, actually. That is a good position for the fluid to rest at. You should only do this when it's cold. If it's hot, the fluid's gonna be up here and it's no good trying to top it up at that point. You, uh, as this is used, as you're using the, the boiler, you will find it does evaporate. So be aware there's a small maintenance job there for an end user to do. Uh, if you hear the boiler getting noisy, I can tell you you've lost the fluid. The fluid's disappeared if it's getting noisy. Almost a little bit like kettling on other domestic boilers. Right, and that's back and that's uh, ready for use. The table's also located in there for use at the front. And 
I've already demonstrated we've got hot water and I think very basically I think I've covered all the points on the caravan so thank you for being with me sorry it's been uh, a bit of a long journey but I do like to demonstrate if I, fully if I can thank you for your time so I've just brought you to the outside of the elegance just so that I can uh, demonstrate what I was referring to about the double intake of water so this is a water intake point but this is also uh, a water intake point and if I lift the flap up fully it says direct to the tank what's that referring to is it's direct to the onboard water tank not to the tap so if I raise this one up you can see it says direct to the tap so this is how I've used the the, the supply today it's coming directly out of the aqua roll going directly to my kitchen tap or my vanity basin it's not feeding the onboard water tank and if you can recall there are positions for that uh, three-way tap to be in in a particular direction for it to flow that way but these are the two positions that this pump connector but well, it's not a pump actually it's uh it's a, what i call a pickup no it is a pump sorry uh the pump there that's what you need when you put it into an acarole just make sure it doesn't fold back up onto itself something like that all right because you're drawing air and water in at the same time you need that to be right down at the bottom edge of your acarole once it's in that position put it into either that union or that union depending on how you want it to work so that's just to demonstrate those two outside points for you